So welcome everyone to the first Egypt Centre fundraising lecture. Uh, this is something that we hope to do uh, on a monthly basis. The second one is coming up on the 20, 28th of August and was just advertised earlier on in some slides and will be available to book uh, from next week. I'm uh, delighted to introduce today's speaker who is uh, Ramadan Badri Hussein, uh, the director of the Sayyid, uh, Zakara Sayyid Tombs Project at the Eberhard Karls uh, University in uh, Tübingen, Germany. After studying Egyptology at Cairo University, Ramadan worked at Giza as an inspector. He received his PhD in Egyptology at Brown University in the United States in 2009 and returned to, uh, to the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities as the head of the Documentation Centre and Chief of Staff to the Minister of Antiquities, where he helped with the curation of Egypt's archaeological heritage. His extensive resume includes work at Giza, Saqqara and the Bahariya Oasis, and an impressive research and publications. Today he will be talking about the work of the Saqqara Sayyid Tombs project, uh, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with from the four-part documentary series, which was recently aired on the National Geographic channel. And I'm certainly very much looking forward to the talk, as I'm sure everybody is today. So many thanks, Ramadan, for uh, offering to give this talk, and over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I don't know what to, how to start, but I would like to thank Ken uh, for giving me the chance to talk to you this afternoon. Um, I have a quite uh, lengthy uh, presentation, so I should just get into the talk and tell you exactly all about the Saqqara Site Tombs project and how it started and what we did and where we stand right now. Um, I started this project in 2016, but my story with the Syed Tombs project, or the Syed Tombs in general, started in 2006 and 2007 when I decided to work on the permit text of the Syed Tombs. Um, I had a proposal to write a dissertation on this topic, and I had to do uh, some on site investigation and examination of these texts. Of course, um, the tombs were very well known, but not, not all of them were accessible and scholars were not really uh, able to get in and check the text themselves. So I was lucky um, being part of the Ministry of Antiquities, the Supreme Council of Antiquities at the time. And then I got uh, a permission to look at most of these tombs. And um, I realized that these tombs do need um, a second round of epigraphic survey. Documentation, oops, documentation, oops. something happening, okay, yeah. Um, it needed a second round of documentation, of course, conservation and also publication. So um, I had my eyes on these tombs all these years, even when I went back to the Ministry of Antiquities. In 2010, I started doing some photographic documentation of some of them, especially Padinisit. Um, but I left the Ministry of Antiquities and I still had the project on my mind and I came to Germany and I applied for funding and I got the funding from the Deutsche Portions Gemeinschaft and I went back to Saqqara to start this project. So to just give you an idea as to the distribution of these site tombs in Saqqara, we know about them, we know where they are, we know what they contain, but we really never got this attention from scholars to be fully published. So around the permit of Unis, we have a cluster of these tombs. Uh, to the south, there's Shan Hibu, Samtik, Padinisit, and there is a missing one that is Nebbajed right here. I don't know where it is exactly, but those four tombs were excavated by Maspero and his assistant Barsente between November 1899 and January 1900. So about uh, almost 110, uh, 20 years ago. We, we know about these four tombs to the south of Unis. And to the east of Unis, Maspero moved in 2000 and, um, 1902, and he discovered Padinit, discovered Hekem Saf, but, and also in the late 40s, um, the Egyptian Zakisa discovered the uh, tomb of Amun Tayefnacht right here. So we know there is a cluster of those um, military commander of Dynast 26 around the Pyramid of Unis, and all of them have copies of the Pyramid text, and this is what made me so interested um, in these tombs. And then we also know about Darcy discovering the tomb of the very famous Psamtik um, that 
uh, tomb from which we have this beautiful uh, basalt cow statue is around the perm around the monastery of Upper Jermia, but we don't know where it is. It also have a very good uh, corpus of permitex copies. We know Presente per Mesper also in 1902 discovered the tomb of Jahur in a causeway of Unas, but there's not a lot of text in there. Around the pyramid of Userkaf, there was the tomb of Heru and also uh, Nefer-Ibra Sanit and another tomb here. Then around the pyramid of Titi, uh, Lepsis documented two very good uh, famous tombs, Samtek Nepati and Herua. They're very, very famous because of the material that came out of them, but we don't know exactly where they are. One of my plans in the future is to try to relocate these two tombs in particular and the tomb of Samtik here because of the corpus of the text in there. So our excavation in the first phase, we focused on two of the tombs to the south here, uh, Psamtik and Padinisit and one tomb in the east that is Amun Taifnacht. And these were the first three tombs of our first phase of the project. Uh, the tomb of Chanihibu was actually um, published by the Italians in the 70s when they had this very big project to work on these tombs, but the project really never gained momentum and then they had to leave the site and went to uh, Bakken Renef for some reason. So we were very lucky that we left, so we have some material left behind from the Italians. So our work is pretty much in this area to the south of the Pyramid of Unis right here. I just wanted to tell you exactly um, how a Dynast 26 shaft tomb or a sarcophagus tomb, as I uh, like to call it, look like. It's a main shaft that is very huge, sometimes 10 meters by 10 meters, and it goes deep to 30 meters. And this is a view of the main shaft of Amun Taifnacht. And every main shaft has a side shaft, either one or three, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, there's no... Um, a pattern of distribution of these side shafts. But the, the thing is, they all lead to an in, um, a corridor and finally out into a tomb with a vaulted ceiling, a tomb, a burial chamber that looks exactly like a monumental sarcophagus. Here comes my designation of them as sarcophagus tombs, just, not just because of the form, um, the architectural form of these burial chambers, but also because of the text tradition of disposition of texts around um, on the walls of these tombs. They were following Middle Kingdom tradition that is uh, exactly the same distribution pattern you would see in Middle Kingdom coffins. So as, we, as I said before, that we all know about these tombs. We all know that they exist, they're very famous, and, but the only archeological information that we know about them comes from the uh, preliminary reports that were published by Maspro and his assistant, Borsanti, in the early, early 1900. This is, in fact, the first issue of the Annal de Service. And in there, you would have um, the report about Padinese, Samtik, and Chanihibu, all three tombs, been uh, with the very conventionalized, stylized drawings of the time, architectural drawings that's not really giving you exact measurements. Everything is very, pretty much, um, unrealistically straight walls and all these things. One of the things that we wanted to do is to go with the 21st century technology in terms of documentation, which is pretty much um, application of digital archeology, span digital documentation that includes 3D documentation uh, in a form of photography that's photogrammetry and also laser scanning in particular. We had to work together um, with my digital archeology span team to find exactly the best way of combining data that comes from the photogrammetry along with the laser scanning to get good um, um, and accurate and precise documentation of these tombs. So we had on our mind uh, three jobs, the documentation, the conservation, and the publication, of course. One of the things that we had to do is to re-excavate these tombs because Maspro has backfilled all the shafts and is include, including the main shafts. So the area where Maspur was working, where Padinisit main shaft is, is this one right here. It was a huge mound, as huge as this. This is the area, this is a situation of the area when we started in uh, March, 2016. Mounds of debris, um, excavation debris that comes from either modern excavations or um, previous excavations in the 1900s, but there were piles of these uh, debris everywhere. They're about five meter high. Pay attention to this one. 
look at this mound of debris because all the new discoveries we made were just lying down underneath this mound of debris here. Masperu had backfilled the main shaft of Paganisit and we started excavating it. If you would like, if you have time, I can talk to you about this hole, but after we finish the lecture. So here is the main shaft of Paganisit. We had to um, re-excavate it partially for mapping purposes and we excavated the shaft of Padinisit. We moved to Tumtik as well. The main shaft is right here. The side shaft is this one here. This is Amun, uh, this is uh, Chani Hibu right here. That's the side shaft where the main shaft is in front. Still, we have the problem of this big, huge mound of debris right here. We always had to use, um, just push it back by building retaining walls and giving ourselves like a couple of meters to excavate and expose the main, the main uh, chapel and the side shaft of uh, Padinisit right here. When we did our uh, partial excavation of the shaft of Padinisit here, we were able to have achieve our, one of our first goals, which is to find archeological evidence as to the superstructure, the nature of the superstructure of these main shafts because we had very conflicting theories about what was once on top of these huge uh, shafts, whether it was a mastaba, whether it was a pyramid, whether it was um, just, it was, it was massive walls and it was left open with no superstructure. There were so many theories about what was on top of them. And I thought that um, we could really salvage some archeological data as to the nature of this superstructure. And we were very lucky because all around the shaft, we have evidence of massive walls surrounding it. And in the south uh, edge of the shaft, right here, this huge uh, platform, what left of it is the, this three course um, platform of um, local limestone. The archeological deposits on them, um, they vary in length, uh, in height. Sometimes they were 15 centimeters high, other times they're about 65 centimeters high but they were a very thick layer uh, of loamy uh, sand uh, that includes a lot of archaeological uh, um, material, including charcoal, uh, including uh, animal bones, including also some seashells. All are indications of some ritual activities happening on this platform overlooking down the shaft here. And behind it, we have the chapel of Padinisit and the side shaft. So I think with this massive wall superstructure that we can look at uh, on top of Padinisit, I came up with an idea, maybe uh, inside this massive walls, there were a mound uh, of debris that would resemble the primeval mound because we don't have any evidence of roofing at this point. So this is an, still an issue of argumentation uh, based on what we have in terms of archeological material that we collected. I, I, I think there might have been just um, a primeval mound inside these um, massive walls. Of course, one of the basic things that we wanted to apply here is uh, digital documentation, digital mapping using laser scanning technology along with photogrammetry to produce our maps and also to um, record every archeological features we have. This is the whole site after our five or six seasons of excavations. We started Padinisit here and we kept pushing to the south because of so many reasons that you will know uh, very shortly. But I want to tell you about every yellow uh, triangle you see on the site. Those are um, scanning stations. Those are laser scanning stations. Um, we had to um, use um, the, the um, datum control point on top of the pyramid of Unis to have derivatives for our maps. And we use laser scanner along with um, the total station and also uh, 365, 60 degrees um, uh, photography to get so many different layers of information. So what you see here is pretty much every station we had the scanner standing on the site. And after that, we merge all these stations, the scanning state, the results of these scanning stations together in order to create our mesh. And the final result is a map that looks exactly like this. This is not a satellite image. This is the result of our laser scanning um, uh, rounds 
along with the photograph with the photography rounds as well. So if you go back here, every yellow triangle was a station for two operations. The first is laser scanning to get the geometry of the site, and the second was a 300 an I star ca I star camera, 360 degrees to get the color information of the entire site. We can put the two kinds of data on top of one another to get the final result like this. This is an image that, that is the result of laser scanning on, um, and ice and photography together. So we went down to uh, these tombs, of course, Samtek, Padinise, Chan Hibu, to uh, laser scan them and also produce photograph uh, photogrammetry. One of the basic things for me personally was these texts right here. And the biggest channel a challenge to do uh, epigraphy and tracing of these, of these texts for the production of facsimile is that distortion. Every, this is a curved surface right here. When you photograph it, it well, you will see distortion all the time. So we had to work together to uh, come up with a workflow that allows us to eliminate distortion in curved surfaces like this and would help other scholars to deal with photographing columns, for example, text on columns, for example. And this is what I'm going to explain shortly. But this is a view of the um, burial chamber of Samtik. And this is a view of our laser scanning model of uh, Padinisi, the one right next to it. And you could see um, how it is polychrome. It's beautiful too, and it's really, really interesting. And even the text there is very interesting. So one of the biggest um, advantages of our laser scanning is that um, we could get really precise measurements of everything. And also in a matter of one or two days, you could come up with your conventional drawings of architectural drawings. So for example, that is your section of the entire east wall of Padinisid and the passage uh, leading into it, and then the side shaft right here. This is pretty much has been extracted from um, a laser scan model um, with a photography transform transferred into the AutoCAD, and in AutoCAD you can get that. Thing. And in a matter of hours, you could have your section right here, which was would take a draftsman a couple weeks to produce, but also it's very, very precise measurements. Um, one of the things that we wanted to deal with in terms of laser scanning and documenting these tombs that is 30 meters deep is to geo-reference every single feature underground, which means we had to bring our total station down, which means also we had to build a, an underground grid that pretty much matching the grid above ground. So we have two surveying grids, the one above ground and the other one underground, because we wanted to know the spatial relationship between every feature above ground and underground. And what you see here is the corridor connecting uh, Psemtik and Padinisit together. And then you see that interesting shift right here, the right angle shift. Later in this lecture, you know there is something here that made the people shift the angle this way. So um, after laser scanning all three burial chambers that were discovered by Maspero in 1900, uh, Padini, Sipsamtik, and Chanehibu here with, this, with geographical positioning and everything, and even the side shaft right here, there is one for Padini, for Sipsamtik that's not visible here. All these areas are new excavations that I will be talking to you shortly. So here comes the point that I just was talking about, how you roll out a curved surface to get it flat and you eliminate distortion in your um, uh, facsimile. And this, this is the eastern wall of the, tomb, the burial chamber of Padinisit after we made the wall straight, not curved. It entails um, a number of steps on AutoCAD where you combine your laser scan um, data with the photogrammetric data also um, with all your coordinates. And then in AutoCAD, there is that cylindrical tool that you have to put your wall inside the cylindrical tool and then you fold it out. Meanwhile, it keeps the, measure, the measurements exact and unchanged. So I explained this in my next article about the Sakara side tunes. Our photogrammetic um, um, approach produces really high resolution images that you could draw directly from them. 
But one of the things that I wanted to say here is that if you don't have the very expensive equipment of laser scans, for example, scanners, for example, you could achieve the same accuracy um, by doing photogrammetry. And this image you see here is a photogrammetic uh, model of the wall of Padinese. So one of the things that we were trying to work on is to, do, to combine different approaches, but at the same time, um, not always work with a very expensive approach. We have to make something that can be friendly to use and also cheap to use on the site. And photogrammetry can also be something like this, but this is a whole different story. We can talk about it later. Um, then in the middle of all our documentation processes and mapping the surface, um, we had to clean around um, a little bit. Where you see the sandbags right here, those are my sandbags. But this is exactly the chapel of Padinisic that was discovered by Maspero in 1900, exactly. January 1900, he uh, discovered this chapel. Exactly less than one meter to the south of where he left, we had this small shaft that is M23-2. And of course, we're very lucky because under this mound, there's a lot of things. And we started to deal with this shaft, of course, after permission from the Ministry of Antiquities at the time. And this is how it looks like a small shaft. The first, the appearance of this shaft gave me the idea that I might be discovering another shaft, uh, another side shaft, uh, to another Dynasty 26 tomb. So all what I was thinking is that, okay, we're going down to another Dynasty 26 tomb where we have a side shaft that's going to go 30 meters deep and then finally leads into the burial chamber. But very quickly working inside this shaft, less than one meter, we found deposits of pottery, one deposit after another, maybe it's about every 25 centimeters we have something. We have a, some archaeological deposit. And two meters deep, we have this beautiful burial of a dog with this uh, pottery. And most of the pottery was uh, packed with either botanical material or uh, soiled linen. And here's how the dog looks like. Um, from the position of the dog, the back, the, the hen part of the dog is resting on uh, this small block. The back is supported with another one. Under the head of the dog, there is another uh, piece of stone right here. So it seems like it was buried with care. And there's even um, vessel, um, a pottery vessel right next to his head. So we can talk about him later. Uh, actually, yeah, we can talk about him later. And then if the dog was not surprising enough for me excavating this shaft, I came across this context right after the dog uh, burial. Um, it's those broken pots right here with red linen in the corner and right next to it, this interesting water bug, this palmetto bug. In fact, from this bug, we have two, we have about eight of them coming out from the same context, in, in fact, two different contexts, contexts um, after one another. Those water bugs, um, they look like the palmetto bugs, that's very famous in America, of course, and, but they are very native to the Nile. That's why they were called Lithecarus niliticus, and mostly they, they live in the water. But they're, they, they, they have a bite, and this is very uh, painful one to the point that they have been described as the scorpion of the water. So one thing at this point, I had to start changing my mind as to what kind of what kind of shaft I'm dealing with. Is this going to lead me to a Dynas 26 tomb or this is something different? Keep in mind the red linen and the white linen that we always find and the, the, the huge amount of botanical remains that we find, and also the stuffing of these uh, pots. This particular bug, um, we all see it in the vignette of Book of the Dead 36, where this, the deceased is uh, spearing uh, a cockroach-like uh, bug, and the text is talking about fighting 
uh, bugs that feeds on the on the on the mummy itself. Uh, that's an interesting thing to see a connection between those bugs and the mummies. But the other interesting thing, those bugs have been associated um, with the goddess Selkit. So one of the goddess that is very, very closely uh, associated with mummification and uh, watching over the canopic jars. So we have two ideas about these bugs. Either they've been uh, placed here um, in an apotropaic ritual to fight those bugs, or in connection with this red linen and the white linen that are the basic two fabrics and color of uh, mummy wrappings, this could be a representation of a sacred goddess, um, the, the, insect, the sacred um, insect of the goddess Selkid. Now, we have something that links us with embalming in here. We go nine meter deep into this shaft. This is M23 too. Nine meter deep, we have this corridor. This is one of the underground tunnels that is part of the network of tunnels from Dynasty Two in Saqqara. Saqqara has three networks. The easternmost one is close to the causeway of Unas, and this belongs to Nienetcher, and it has been excavated by Hanover, Gunther Dreyer. They documented everything, and we know that it's for Nienetcher, and it was reused for burial in Dynasty 19 and also in the late period. The second network of those, this underground tunnels, it starts exactly at the northern eastern corner of the Pyramid of Unas, runs south, and this is one of these galleries that runs uh, under the site we're working on. M23-2 cuts through it, and then it continues deep down to another four meter or three and a half meter. We have this very large room here. And in this room, there's another view to show you the relationship between the side shaft of Padimisit, the main shaft of Padimisit, M23, the corridors of the second dynasty gallery, and then that large room. It's about five meters by nine meters. So this is definitely for me, it's not a dynasty 26 tomb. This is something different. The, the, that room you've seen is completely filled with debris, sand, uh, stone blocks like this, and a lot of uh, pottery material, cups, bowls, amphorae, um, all of them are very interesting. But the interesting also is these blocks right here. Uh, I'll tell you why. The cups and the bowls we found, um, we had a very, very large corpus. In fact, they were placed in one area of this tomb that is about two meters by three meters and one meter high. It was a concentration of those cups and bowls and vessels. A lot of them, almost 155 of them, have inscriptions of that kind. Uh, some of them are um, embalming instructions. Some of them are actually names of uh, mummification substances. For example, here, wet with her or with it. So whatever substance in this cup was used for wrapping or embalming. And here, wet in the day 34. So this is embalming in the day 34. Whatever material in here was used during day 34, of the mummification. Um, and of course, you would notice that for philologists, we would notice something interesting. is the combination of hieratic writing along with demotic in one thing. Same happens here. On this bowl, we have the sifich oil here with the NTU in the same bowl as a mixture. We know Sifich as being one of the sacred oils, the seven sacred oils they use for mummification, also opening the mouth. And also NTUs always being thought of as myrrh. So our work has given us some other ideas about NTU. But the very interesting thing is that in one bowl, you would have both Sifich as an oil or an unguant and NTU together. So there is a mixture of these two in this bowl here. Philologists would also notice the interesting thing of having demotic inscription along with hieratic inscription. This is a chronological marker. This puts the text we're dealing with as middle, middle of dynasty 26, this proto-demotic text. 
So this is on the important philological importance of this corpus and also on the archaeometric importance of the corpus is that we have a large uh, residue of the substance in here. We made sure to eliminate all uh, contamination because I've realized that we have really golden opportunity for a good project of residual analysis here. So the other important feature in this room was this, um, uh, well, well, the lich right here, like a mastaba with the channels in the back, uh, there's some activities happening here, but this particular uh, large vessel in the corner here with a wall built around it, that was for me a good indication that it was put there intentionally, which means there's, there were certain human activities happening 13 meter deep underground in this uh, chapel, so in this room. So what is the content of this vessel in terms of debris? You see inside there was really dark sand, really, really dark sand, with large amount of uh, charcoal, including traces of burning on the sides right here. When I saw this vessel, I had two ideas uh, uh, running into my head. The first thing was Dawson's idea that um, the, during the mummification process, a deceased would have been put inside a sinew vessel, this large vessel, and been either showered with this salt water, the natron salt water, or been immersed in, uh, directly inside this vessel. And he, of course, has these two fantastic scenes from the New Kingdom that, you, that shows the two embalmers showering the deceased with this particular uh, salt solution and the deceased sitting on top of the Sunu vessel. But the fact is, um, we don't have any evidence of a salt bath of this particular vessel used for salt bath. We have evidence of dark soil, charcoal, and traces of burning in there. So I was talking to Philip Stukamer about what can be the interpretation here. And he has this fantastic idea about uh, Egyptians burning uh, incense, uh, not to exposing the incense directly to uh, the charcoal. They wanted a slow process of uh, fumigation. So they would have a layer of charcoal in the bottom, then a layer of sand with animal fat, and then they put the incense in there. And that would means you get sand that is mixed with animal fat, and then the, the, um, the incense would be burning slowly here. So for me, that became a permanent source of fumigation right here. And that particular lidge with the drainage channel in the back, for those of you who've seen the documentary, I think this is a prime candidate for the evisceration process happening here. And that would be an interesting source of fumigation. You need it for so many reasons. First, if you're dealing with human cadaver, you want to deodorize the, the place, especially if it is 13 meter deep. If you're dealing with human cadaver, you want to drive insects away, so smoke would really get them away. And also, if you want, if you're dealing with mummification that is in reality a set of uh, rituals performed over 70, 70 days, you need incense as one of these uh, magical substances and ritual substances as well. But there was one question I was given um, uh, by anatomists when I spoke to them about the identification of the function of this room. They were telling me, okay, everything you're describing here looks exactly how we do it in our injection room in modern hospitals when we have to embalm uh, a person. But there is one thing left that is the ventilation. Where do you bring that fresh air all the time so I was happy when I got this question because I told them, working down in this room, I could feel the uh, air moving through this dynasty to uh, core tunnels right here. So that became the ventilation system, the air shafts that the Egyptians appropriated dynasty to underground galleries to cut this shaft through them and have their first underground, for the, they have their wabit underground so I think this might be uh, the Awabit, but is underground. For those of you who are not familiar with Awabit, 
The Wabit is the workshop and was, according to the Old Kingdom text, one of the two main buildings, buildings for mummification. The Wabit and the Ibu, the Ibu, the Tent of Purification, both of them collapsed in one building uh, in the later periods in, in the uh, New Kingdom in particular, along with other um, uh, architectural units to be uh, components of the Paranifer complex. So I had on my mind the question of these stones. Yeah, excuse me if I'm going back and forth. Those ones. We all know in Bamar uh means those important vessels, they became sacred because they were part of a secret ritual that is mummification. And it, it was a habit for the embalmers to collect all the vessels and then hide them, either in a small shallow pit right next to the tomb or in a, an antechamber right next to the burial chamber or in a deeper uh, shaft. But because they were sacred objects. But what made these stones so valuable that they had to be put with these um, embalmer cachet pottery? Especially all of them have traces of mortar on the side, which gave me the idea they must have been part of a construction that has been dismantled and put with these sacred objects in this wabit when it was ceased to, fun when it ceased to function as a wabit. So we came outside of this shaft to look for the structure. And about one meter or one meter and a half, we have the corner of this structure right here. And we had to close the site of that season. And in the following season, we came to deal with the mound above it. And that was the mound. The first thing we did is that we identified the corners of this particular structure right here. And they ended up to be rectangular as you could see, and the inside was this interesting, beautiful mud brick ramp and dividing up the entire area into two equal spaces, one space right here and another space right here. This one with the mud brick uh, structure around it, a similar one, you could see the silhouette of this um, mud brick structure right here, but completely collapsed. But here inside you have a depression that is about 65 meters deep. And here it is on the ground level, and, but there is very interesting context, this one right here. We have two vessels uh, that is packed with soiled linen, and inside there was this black uh, resinous substance. Um, I don't want to call it tar for, for now. It is a petroleum byproduct, uh, naturally occur, uh, occurs in, and, and is being collected. Um, it has to be heated. The linen wrappings would be soaked in it. And we have the evidence that these two vessels here with the linen uh, that is soiled with this pitchman or black substance, you see it here, which gives us an idea about possibly preparation of this linen wrappings happened inside this room, but what this room was about. We'll talk about it. But to look at the layout, this particular layout here, the rectangular with the ramp in the middle and the two equal spaces, it, I had to think uh, about the Ibu uh, representation in the Old Kingdom tombs, in the tomb of Kar Giza, in the tomb of Idu, in the tomb of uh, uh, Miruruka at Sakar, in the tomb of Pepean Kem at Mer, and I think Pepean Kem is just the best example I could show you of this particular layout. The ramp is right here, and an, a room is here with a side entrance and another room right here with another side entrance. Those could be a back side entrances uh, of this rectangular. So this is what an Ibu of the Old Kingdom looks like. And this, for the first time, I could make the link between the two-dimensional representation of an Ibu in the Old Kingdom and the actual, uh, actual real life structure right here, but still have stuff lying underneath this four meter high mound here. Uh, interesting thing is that the pottery collected from this area exactly matching the pottery that came out M23 Dawabit underground here. So <clears throat> in the cleaning, after we cleaned this entire 
rectangular space right here. And you could see the depression in this room. And this is where I think the natron treatment, um, the, the treatment of the body with natron would happen here. Um, Stephen Bachman might think that it's been used um, the, the, the salt solution. I think it might be just using dry natron in here. I'm not sure, but it could be either one. Uh, the depression alone would uh, say this is a place where the body has been tre treated with natron. And here's with, where the linen wrappings would be prepared. And this is the wall bit where mummification would take place. At least evisceration would be taking place underground here. But this entire rectangular space does not give up surprises because in the middle we have this large shaft, three meter by three meter and a half, and it will go down to 30 meter. This is, by the way, a photogrammetic uh, model of the chapel of Padinisit the platform of Padinisit and M23, our mummification complex starts right here. And you could see this is where Maspro stops and this is where we made our discovery. So we go to this shaft that is uh, K24. Just to give you this, one of the very nice um, um, images that I hope to make it to Kingdom of the Mummies um, uh, series, because it uses our 3D uh, documentation and the laser scanning with the photogrammetry together to create um, the, this image that shows relationship between structures above ground and the other one underground. So what you see here is the Wabit underground with M23, the shaft leading down to it, and then K24, it's right here, and the above is the Ibu-like structure right here. All these small holes around it those are sh small shafts that cut through and leads to the second dynasty galleries. So I'll tell you more about it. So let's go down K24 and see how it looks like. First, even meter, we see mummies. Um, one mummy on the northern wall of this shaft. And we continue deep down about four meters deep. After this mud brick lining, you see that um, sort of cutting into the wall with uh, plaster covered um, uh, with this demotic text. The primary translation of this text that um, it's sort of a family disagreement between a mother and her daughter-in-law over the burial of the son husband in here. It seems like the mother was not really um, approving of her son being buried in this place. That alone gave me an idea that burying in this place could be by arrangement and also something for the um, public. So I started to think about excavating this um, K24 and what it could lead us, lead us down to, either a new tomb or what. But about eight and a half meters deep, we have in the Western Wall an entrance that was made to, into the Second Dynasty Gallery, one of those galleries. So as I said, they turn and twist and they go everywhere. Saqqara has this huge city underground of those tunnels. And we didn't really excavate them, but we, I had to just venture a little bit and see what's going on in there. I could see uh, mummies that later on uh, matching the mummies we found in this shaft right here. And this will be on top of our excavation um, list in the next seasons. We would like to document all these shaft, this underground galleries. So we went down to about nine meters into K24. We have this burial chamber. This one is cut into the northern wall. You have a hallway and niches in all sides, in the three sides, and even shelves for mummies on the sides right here. Some of those niches where you have mono burial, some would be double, triple, and four people would be buried in those niches. Meanwhile, there were people here piled up on top of one another, rows of these mummies. And one of the mummies has 
a set of those beautiful Shamapti figurines right here. And we started cleaning it and underneath it, there was this anthropoid sarcophagus. And of course, the first thing, if you want to see social hierarchy in this particular room, in this particular uh, hallway and the side niches, it is very visible that people were buried here on top of one another. The space would have been utilized for people here. Others who had private ones or others would share it. And in this one, there is a guy with a mummy, um, the arms crossed over the chest, but um, we'll talk about them later. So we go down. Uh, in fact, we didn't leave uh, that nine meter deep level across from this complex, from this tomb, that is tomb three, we have another cut on the, in the southern wall where we have two mummies uh, put, put inside them. Then we continue going deep in K24 until we reach around 17 meters deep right here in this area, in the middle of the shaft, not in burial chambers cut into the walls. We have another sequence of burials. Um, rows of mummies on top of one another, head to toes. One of them had this beautiful wooden coffins, but it's completely, completely uh, destroyed uh, by water. I think the shaft was never meant to be closed, and at some point it was filled with um, downpours, reaching down and destroying all this uh, beautiful wooden coffins here. But one of the things that I was noticing is that mummy of the child squished against the wall, put in the corner right here. And in fact, over this guy, there was another a child burial here. It's just put upside down right here. It seems that whoever was placing these people there just had to deal with space constraint and making sure to make space for more burials to come. Either the place, because the place was very sacred, the shaft itself had some connection to the god of the dead Osiris, or um, to make, to maximize profit of putting people inside. So we leave this particular sequence of burial and we go 20 meters, uh, 20 meters deep. In the southern wall, we have this burial chamber right here. This is how we found it. Uh, the entrance blocked completely. And we had two of the blocking stones with, um, with this uh, photographic, uh, super, uh, genealogical text. So <laughs> one of them is Menechhet and the other one is Menechusir. So from that text, we know that there is, the, both of them are an uncle and a nephew. It's so very interesting to have uh, two family members that, is, that are having a private compartment in this place. And the, inside the burial chamber, we have these two people. Uh, one of them is Menech Osir and the other one is Menech Hef, who is who, I'm not sure, because I don't have any epigraphical material with these two. But we have, we, each of them has this single canopic jar, just one, not the usual four. And one of them has this Osiris corn mummy right here. But we leave these two and we go down 30 meters deep, right here. What is happening? We, leave, we have a complex of burial chambers, as you could see from this model right here. But the entrance is about two meters wide and 220 high. But on top, there is that engraving right here. First time I saw it, I thought I have the achit represented here. But I have, but when I start looking at it, okay, this is, goes like a leg and then it has a little bit of depression here and it goes up to the chest area and possibly the head area was right here. I think if this depression might have contained at some point some sort of inlay, but we lost it. But what we see here is a mummy represented in profile. It gives us an idea what we really expect inside this place. So we are deep 30 meters into K24. This is the bottom of it. And we started our laser scanning documentation of the whole complex. The debris inside this room, we, inside this complex, we needed to document it. 
we needed to know exactly how the Egyptians left these rooms, the situation exactly. And this is what you would see. This image is two hallways, and on the sides, there are things that is blocked, like this one, for example. There are pottery vessels, large pottery vessels lying around everywhere, stone blocks falling, large amount of sand along with mud brick pushed against the side walls, and occupying the middle of the rooms, like this. What you see here is the result of a laser scan uh, recording along with iStar camera. So this is not a photograph, this is a 3D model uh, that is produced by laser scanning. So we started to look at our model. One of the models that we have is K24 with M23 leading down into this Wabit underground and the corridor of Dynasty 2 that connects them. And this is the entrance from the K24 all the way to this corridor. And there's so many burials inside this one and the appropriation of these underground tunnels as the ventilation system for the Wabit right here. So K24 goes down to one hallway, a second hallway, and on the side there are six burial chambers. Let's, and here's why I told you about the straightness, oops, no, no, here. That straight corridor connecting Padinisit and Samtik had to shift a little bit twice and make this right angle because the distance between these two are less than two and a half meters. So the ancient Egyptians who were digging the burial, uh, this, the, 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 the tunnel, the corridor that connects Tamtik and Padinisi together, they were aware of the existence of these particular um, complex of burials of K24, which means, archaeologically speaking, this preceded this. So that's a good thing about having our total stations 30 meters deep and insisting to get the geo reference um, of every single feature underground. So if we go back to this burial complex, this is tomb six in K24. We have the first hallway and the second hallway and all these burial chambers around it. And then we start with this one because this is the first one we identified and we started working with it. And this is the one we discovered life with National Geographic when you see in the first episode. So this one belongs to Tadi Hor. And this is a photogrammatic model of where, how we, the situation of Tadi Hor's burial chamber when we discovered it. This huge lid of the sarcophagus, the um, Shawapti figurines in two wooden frames resembling two wooden boxes. Then you have the wooden frames and boxes of the canopic jars. Two are here and two on the other side. And this very mysterious wooden frame that I have no idea what it was for because it's just a piece of wood that completely decayed and underneath it was completely sand, nothing. Behind the shaft, in, behind the, this lid, there is another um, vessel right here. So this is how the sarcophagus and the burial chamber of Tadihor looked like when we started cleaning everything up and lifting these vessels, we found out that there is, in the bottom of the floor, there is a, um, 12 mummification cups, 10 of them made of marl clay and two were faience ones, including, and also this uh, boat models, two of them, they're all sun uh, dried mud, and also the figurine of the jackal, and a very deformed jet pillar made of mud as well, including the magical bricks. And a torch or a lamp was put in here. You put all these um, objects together and you think of one thing, the pa ritual paraphernalia of Book of the Dead 151, that is pretty much the finalization of the mummification also entombment of the deceased. It looks like it's just a perfect example of putting archaeology and text together to explain the final moment of entombments of Tadi Hur, bringing all these objects and placing them in her uh, burial chamber. And this is the canopic jars of Tadi Hur. We found only three of them and four lids. I thought at the time, this is, I think, the first um, 
case of consumer fraud uh, because clearly she paid for four canopic jars. She got three and four lids. And also, uh, they're all mismatching, as you could see. Another thing happened with uh, Tari Hor, the wooden, um, the anthropoid wooden coffin inside the sarcophagus. It didn't have this wooden mask uh, for it. So I think that's the second consumer fraud uh, with Tari Hor right here. So this is her uh, wooden coffin inside. This is a photogrammatic model of her sarcophagus and the very, very, very fragile and dusty uh, wooden coffin. But it has this painted plaster with this beautiful uh, polychrome text, red, blue, and I think at some point it was yellow or something like that. Uh, but all, those are the remnants, uh, the remains of um, the Book of the Dead uh, 72. The final section of 72 when the deceased reached uh, the gate where the demon Tekem stands and he had this nice dialogue with Tekem. So that's a very interesting, um, you know, edit, editorial decision on the part of the editor, how to deal with a small space that is the wooden coffin to condense the very long 70, a book that is 72 in the very meaningful and purposeful one uh, section that is when the deceased meets Tekken, because when he talks to him, he talks about all the demons he saw before uh, Tekken. It's a very interesting one, I thought. So we want to leave Tarihur and cross and go across this hallway, the second hallway, to this room right here. This is the room where we have this very interesting anthropoid um, sarcophagus that belongs to Yiput and the other rectangular one that belongs to Chanimit. And in, on the floor, there were two wooden coffins right here, completely decayed, as you see. This is a photogrammatic model along with the laser scan we have. One of the things that we wanted to do with our digital documentation is to also not document existing structures and move, movable objects, but also to, to document um, archaeological situation, to document uh, context before we remove it and um, make it uh, to have multiple documentation of the process of excavation itself. So you could see this is how the position of these vessels, the canopic jar right here, the bowls were here, even the organic material that was inside this canopic jar that belongs to Chani meat, the other canopic jar that belongs to Yiput. And this one is very interesting because it was plastered and you could see the four sons of Horus on this canopic jar right here. So the one thing that brings these two people together, Yiput and Chani meat, one of the many things, is that they were priests of uh, um, Muchas. Believe me, it took me two weeks to decide on the reading of her name. Uh, clearly, on the sarcophagus of Chanimit, it's, her name is written with an Yut sign, the city sign, and here is written only with a circle, as it, you could see it in early Ptolemaic texts. But the pottery here, is Dynas 26, especially this one, because this one was found in the foundation deposits of Amazis. So we're dealing with the Dynas 26, but the early occurrence of Neuchias as not just as an epithet, because it appeared in a new kingdom only as an epithet of the goddess Mut. When Mut assumes a serpent form, Ramses II recites her names um, in the bark station of Mut in the temple of Luxor, when she assumes that serpent form, he calls her, you are becoming Wertekau, Renanuted, you're becoming this and this, and among of all the serpent goddesses, she is a Muchias. She maintains that association with Mut um, all along, even during the Ptolemaic period, she only the serpent form of Mut. But for the first time that we have priesthood associated with this goddess, Shanimit was a priest of many, many gods and goddesses, including Sekhmet, Isis, Jehuti, Ammon, of course, and Neuchias. Same thing with Yiput right here. He was a god of Ammon and Neuchias. One of those guys right here, the plaster that remains over the decayed wooden coffin shows me the sign of the Neut, the city. So I think 
also one of them was a priest of New Chess, at least. Possibly all four people were priests of um, New Chess. But that says something about New Chess possibly having a temple or a chapel in the area. But after I finished really documenting uh, the, the filming with National Geographic about New Chess and everything, it came to my mind one another idea about New Chess and her connection with Moot. Because in Chani Meet, her name is written not just with the serpent. I hope you saw it in, uh, in the documentary. Um, her name is written with a lioness headed serpent, which means she is not now a serpent form. She's also being elevated to a feline goddesses. And all these feline goddesses, Mut, of course, one of them, but the most important one of them are Bastid and also Sekhmet. So if you look at the connection between Bastid and Sekhmet to Sakar, it is very huge. You have the Bubastian in Sakar, and also Sekhmet is one of the main goddess of Memphis. And there was a chapel of Sekhmet Sahore in Abu Sir. So it makes sense to really associate Nuches in Sakar with either Bastid or Sekhmet. And I think based on one of the statues uh, from Sakar, I think it's, it's in, the, in the Brooklyn Museum now, I have to double check that statue, where Nuches appear, appears also as a form of Sekhmet in Sakar. So it's very interesting that we, in one burial chamber, we have more information about Sekhmet than we ever had before. So we leave this burial chamber of Chanimit and Yukut, and my argument for this, for their Libyan origin, um, I think uh, Chanimit is clearly the, si the child of the cat. The connection between the Libyan community with the cat is very prominent. Yukut is a very Libyan sounding name. It appeared from the Dynasty 26 all the way, even Dynasty 20, uh, sorry, it appeared in Dynasty 22 all the way to Dynasty 26, and you could see that you put a uh, name connected with the Libyan community. So we leave Yiput and Chanimit and we go, I think the next one is yes, this one right here. This burial chamber, we have when we found it, we had this sarcophagus right here, this huge one, bigger than uh, Tadi Hur's sarcophagus. And on top of it were three decayed wooden uh, coffins. As you could see, actually two wooden coffins and this was just a mummy. And in the back, there is another mummy right here. So this burial chamber used at least four, five times, I think six times. Uh, five times from what we see. This is four burials and one in the sarcophagus. I think the sarcophagus was reused. That makes it six times. So interestingly, this particular mummy uh, coffin right here, was completely decayed, but it maintained some of this painted plaster. But during the excavation and before the National Geographic came to site to film with us, we made this interesting discovery on the face of this mummy right here. It was this particular object. It was this gilded silver mask, as you could see it on the face of the mummy right here. Sakara, in fact, gave us a gilded silver mask from the tomb of Ojahor, and it was discovered by a mask from in 1902, but he found it completely corroded because Ojahor burial chamber was completely submerged with water. And the other gilded silver mask, um, well, the other mask from Sakara was also discovered by Maspro in the tomb of Hekamsaf. It was, it is been listed in uh, the Egyptian Museum uh, Cairo as, a, as made of gold. And it's moved now to the Grand Egyptian Museum and it's also been recorded as made of gold. I think we need to go back and re-examine it. Uh, it might be gilded silver mask uh, because when even Maspro found, Barzenti found it, he was, they said they couldn't realize it was a mask because it was covered with a thick layer of pitchment. So that's protected from corrosion, of course. So the next, the, the third kind of this mask, uh, or the second kind of the gilded silver mask we know about, was discovered by Sami Gabra in the tomb of Angkor in Tuna Gabal in 1939. Then comes this one in 2018, was discovered on the face of a 
coffin uh, of a mummy that turned out for after physical examination to be of a woman. And from the remains of the text that we have on this wooden coffin, she was a priestess of Mut and also a priestess of Neuchias. So this is pretty much the third or the fourth um, mention of Neuchias in one single complex as her having a priesthood uh, connecting to her. And of course, the the revenues, the richness of the temple or the chapel of Neuchias would be reflected completely on the richness of the burial chambers of these priests and priestesses. So it was very interesting to know that this gilded silver mask is on top of the face of a woman. So, but the large sarcophagus in this room right here uh, belongs to a person by the name Dinit Yalit. And the short of his name, the short form of his name was written on the Shawapti figurine as Yawit, an old man or a wise man. And this is his beautiful calcite Kenobi jars. Um, it's just amazing. And of course, all of them contain his organs and we see to scan one of them, that's the MST one, uh, the, I think the one with the liver uh, that we have, uh, we, uh, we see to scan it. Uh, so this is his full name, Dini Tiawit, but on the um, Shawapti, he goes only by this one, Iyawit. That's why we said Iyawit. We cross this hallway to this burial chamber that was, it was blocked off with a very big wall that was at some point part of the consolidation, the ancient consolidation system. The Egyptians um, in Dynasty 26 clearly noticed that they, they cut this complex 30 meters deep into a natural fault. And some of these walls were collapsing. So they had to abandon the, this complex after doing great work of consolidation, especially in this area right here, and in the um, area leading into this burial chamber here. There was a huge wall blocking it. And this is the one that you see when we try to take it down um, uh, on film. And we, when we get in, uh, a look inside this burial chamber, this is a photogrammatic model of the uh, situation of this uh, burial chamber. All three wooden coffins completely decayed. This particular wooden plank had a, you could see the silhouette of a text here. It had a copy of Permit Text 228, this one beautiful spell of these uh, serpent spells uh, group. So it was written here, and it's very, very dominant, and you see it in, on every coffin, every tomb uh, from Dynasty 26. But in the back, you could see this wall separating these three wooden coffins, and in the back, you had this beautiful burial of the very famous Ta Didi Busted, but we went with the short Didi Busted during filming. So you see it with those, this is a photogrammatic model, highlighted after this graphic company took the thing. And you could see the wooden coffins, uh, the, uh, the wooden boxes of the Kenobi jars completely decaying. One of them is falling here, and the other wooden box is right here with the Kenobi jars here. Then comes the issue of these two small canopic jars right here. One of them with the falcon head and the other one with the baboon head, just right on the two sides of the coffin of Digi Busted here. So, and this is what we did when we CT scanned um, the two uh, extra canopic jars to find out that there is um, soft tissue inside, human tissue inside. One of the two hypotheses I was working with either that these two canopic jars contained remnants of embalming substances uh, of Didi Busted, of Ta Didi Busted, or it could have some other organs. And from the CT scan we had, we made sure, we were sure that there is soft tissue inside these ones, which, as you heard in the movie, puts us talking about the economics of embalming and the mummification workshop complex and the embalmers offering different packages um, for different people because we had to talk about the economics of mummification, of course, mummification as a business. And I'll come to this point very shortly. But before we go into mummification as a business, this is 
the situation of those six burial chambers. Um, laser scanning and photogrammetry together, we had to reconstruct virtually these, this particular context. So it shows you how it was left uh, after 2,600 years. Taji Hoare, with laser scan and photogrammetry together, is right here. Didi busted situation and the other wooden coffins right here and across the hallway, Iyawit wooden coffin along with all this mummy, uh, wooden, uh, wooden coffins and the mummy and the other mummy in the back. You put and Chani meet and the two decayed wooden coffins here. And in the fifth burial chamber, there is a single wooden coffin with faience figurines in here. The faience figurines has the name of Khunsu Yirdis and this is another person. So it looks like 30 meters deep. The one thing you notice is that the ratio of female burials to male burials. We have more women than men in this place. The only two people that we are sure that they were men, Chanimit and Yiput. The rest are pretty much women. Um, uh, sorry, Chanimit and Yawit. Yiput, I was completely surprised to know that the physical characteristics of the mummy is a female, not a male. And what I see here, even from, if you remember, that 17 meters deep sequence of burials with all the wooden coffins and the kid, uh, the child pushed against the wall, we have 10 coffins out of this place. All 10 except for children, female. It looks like the K24 as a shaft is a female dominated shaft. A lot of people, and some of them of really, really high status, like Tati Hor, of course, Padinese, and of course, the priestess with the gilded solar mask, Yaput as well. So do, dare I hope to a similar shaft that is male dominated in the vicinity of K24? Who knows, hope so. But to give you an idea, this is just to show you the Wabit, and K24 and the old excavations of Maspo. But to go back to this complex of mummification workshop underground, e, an Ibu-like structure where certain mummification activities take place and the communal burial chapter. These three units are spatially and functionally associated. They're close to one another, especially K24 that is cut in the middle of the Ibu-like structure, which says it has a, an association with the Ibu-like structure. All three, and there's another room right here, I think uh, doesn't show here, but it was a place where any heating and firing um, would be taking place outside of the Ibu-like structure and it would be done here. So this particular complex, of mummification related building. I think it's the first clearly identified mummification workshop. We haven't had something that uh, both the material coming out of it and the layout speaks of mummification complex. This complex helps us a lot to put mummification into a completely different um, perspective, which is the economics of it, especially when we analyze, we had the first results of the chemical testing so of all this residue. We have a long list of imported oils and um, resins. None of them is, uh, comes from Egypt, of course, and it speaks about a very intensified trade network that is all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Some of them goes as far west, as far east as India, uh, to produce, to bring these products. The other thing is the wooden, the wooden coffins that you all saw, very decayed. Um, all of them comes from uh, the Southern Europe and Anatolia. So those are also imported wood, which makes it it's very expensive. So we're talking about not just the archeology span of mummification through this complex, but also the economics of mummification. Not we know about mummification and mummification workshops current effort from text from all this balsamirung ritual papyri, but we never really had a chance to identify those real life structures and know the ibut, the connection between the ibut, uh, the the wabit, sorry, 
and the Ibu structures and the other associated buildings. Um, we didn't have a chance to know exactly um, something about where, where is the place, not just for the embalmers to work, but also for the administrators of this complex, because from a lot of uh, papyri, we know about the Kawakite priests, those are the Wahmu, who pretty much were the administrators of this place. Those were the businessmen running the mummification workshop complexes. Uh, those are the people who were being responsible um, after contracts with a person, either in, during their life or um, arrangements with the family. They will take charge of picking up the mummy, the, the corpus from the house, taking it to the mummification workshop, purchasing old mummification substances, purchasing coffins or sarcophagi, and even purchasing a grave. So this is a class of priests who were pretty much um, professionals, uh, people of religion, as well as business people. So it's very interesting to be able to finally have all this wealth of knowledge that comes from textual sources, like all these papyri, and try to identify exactly the places, the real life structures where they worked. And this is what makes me so happy um, knowing all this information from text and then all of a sudden when I'm uh, um, excavating to find places where these class of priests might have worked. Future work of, uh, future of our project, this mound of debris is interesting and we will be handling it. To the east, to the west, there's another large mound right here. We need to clean these two and move south as well. Those small holes, they lead all of them into the Dynasty uh, two galleries. It would be interesting to continue documenting, publishing the texts of the tombs that Masprou excavated because we moved to the east of, uh, for the Padimit and Hekemsaf tombs. And my hope is to be able to come out with the first monograph on the text of Padimisit uh, by mid uh, next year, and then complete the excavations in the area as well. We have a very large project, so many people working together to be, to be able to produce some knowledge about the landscape of Dynasty 26 in the area around um, the primitive Unis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ramadan, for that excellent lecture. It was uh, really fantastic, and I think it, it's pretty clear that this is one of the most significant excavations and discoveries that has been made in the last few decades. So thank you very much for sharing it with us. Um, I missed you at the very beginning in terms of you talking about the various people at Saqqara. You mentioned Samtek, uh, multiple terms of Samtek. I was just wondering whether one of them was Samtek, son of uh, Yahweben, who's well known from the... Uh, I think five stele from the period uh, dates the reign of uh, Amasis. It's um, it's very interesting because <clears throat> the 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 this one is uh, Semtek. His father is um, I don't know. I can't remember even uh, the name of his father, but I'm not sure if this, he is the same one. But this is the guy. He was the commander of the Libyan mercenaries, and he was also a, the chief physician as well. Um, I'm not sure he has only one seraphim steel, and we know it's it dates back to year 22 of the time of Amazis, so he's pretty much in the middle of the reign of Amazis. But I'm not sure he is the one you're talking about. The other something is right here, and I, I'm not sure I know his father's name really. The reason why I bring that up is that we have a canopic jar in the Egypt center belonging to this Samtek son of Yahwebin, and as far as I know, it's the only. Um, piece of his burial equipment known, aside from uh -huh. the the five stele that uh, that are uh, well documented. There's, I think, two of them in the Imhotep Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you might be correct. It can can come from Saqqara, especially this area right here. This area, there is so many shafts from Dynasty Twenty Six. This has been excavated, emptied, um, maybe late nineteenth century no record whatsoever about what's happening here, but there is a lot of Dynasty 26 tombs in this area, all of them are shafts. Um, maybe it's coming out of 
this place right here. Yeah. It could very well. It's certainly from an old excavation. Yeah. But yeah. when, we don't know. So we have uh, quite a few questions. If anybody has any further questions, do post them into the Q&A sec uh, um, section that you'll see the button at the bottom. And Sam and I will ask the questions to uh, Ramadan uh, for you now. So thank you very much again for that. Uh, the first question here by Vanessa was asking, what is the, bu the bug made of? Was it a real one or a model? No, the, the, the real bugs, I had pleasure <laughs> picking them up. Um, those were real ones. That's why um, I had um, an entomologist to talk to and try to identify those bugs. No, those are real nice ones. Um, we have exactly six complete ones um, and, and the other two were torn apart. Um, th but those are not uh, models, not amulets. They are, those are real ones. They look quite big as well. And they look disgusting. <laughs> They're really disgusting. But I, had to, I was picking them up and my team members, so it's like those young Egyptians, they were like, oh, okay, now we find, we're finding cockroaches. I was like, wait a minute, they're important. <laughs> so. Thank you, Dr. Ramadan. We've got lots of people thanking you for the amazing lecture and the talk. My pleasure. I have a question about the mummies and what happened to them after excavation. Did they stay in situ? Are they in storage? Beautiful, Museum? beautiful, beautiful question. And uh, believe me, I give a very uh, lengthy statement about uh, what we do with the bones and the mummies um, to the National Geographic team. They, they did fantastic, but it was, they couldn't really edit it in. Um, of course, all the mummies and the bones that we have, uh, 17 uh, skeletons have been um, examined and x-rayed, and they were the base for an MA thesis written by Leone, who is a German uh, student here in Tübingen. Leone will continue working on the other 54 uh, mummies and skeletons that came out of K24. K24, all told, we have 54 mummies and skeletons. What do we do after studying x-raying and do everything? And even in the interim period here, we have reused the wabbit here, this wabbit. We have reused that place here and built a uh, wooden shelves in this, against this wall and every skeleton that has been examined and studied by Leone is put inside a wooden box, labeled where it came from, and stored in this place. The other uh, mummies that are not um, examined and processed yet by Leone are still in wooden boxes and put against this wall. But for the mummies, all the mummies that came out of tomb six, uh, right here, all of these individuals, every single one went back to their rooms. Tadihur is back after the x-ray that you've seen, is back to her burial chamber. Uh, all these individuals are back to their burial chambers in wooden boxes or on top of wooden shelves. Uh, make, make sure those mummies are really, really, really fragile. So some of them, we pick them up really nice, and some of them, they just uh, become bones. And the other thing is the x-ray has shown us a lot of them has those beautiful amulets uh, in the wrappings. We didn't pick out uh, the amulets. We leave the amulets where they are. So there is no picking out of things. There is no taking... Um, these things apart. We only have to, as I said in my documentary, they look to some people old dusty bones, but those are humans. In fact, this is the, sentence, the statement I made in the context of what I was saying about how we prepare to store and study all these bones in the mummies. We've got at least three people asking the question about uh, the dog and whether you could say more about that. Did you yes. find out uh, about it? Yes. Um, in fact, the dog was pretty much would give it away for me 
as this place being connected to it, mummification, this shaft being connected to mummification. Uh, because in one of the very interesting papyri, um, or even references, textual references uh, from Dynasty 26 and later, Robert Rittner wrote a nice article about the god Horus the Hound, Horus the Dog. Horus has been in the late period, especially from Dynasty 26 onward, has been identified as uh, one of the many attributes of Horus is now he's becoming Horus the Dog. And the job of Horus the Dog, he is the embalmer who mummified his father Osiris. And I was very happy to find this article written by Robert Rittner. Um, I wish him a speedy recovery. Um, that it identifies one of the things about Horus is him being the dog that mummified his uh, father Osiris. So the dog here is pretty much a representation of an embalmer. But one interesting thing about the backfilling of this shaft, I don't want to get into how this shaft was backfilled because it's a completely different process from what you see in here. And I hope uh, for the publication, uh, people can just bear with me and wait for the final publication because I have a different scenario of how this shaft was backfilled to this point. Because I have two different corpora of pottery that coming out of one out of the shaft here and the other one out of this room. They're completely different. So which gives me two different scenarios as to how the mummification workshop ceased to exist and also how the shaft was backfilled. I need to excavate the area around to be able to talk about the possible scenario I have that this shaft was backfilled possibly dynasty 30 early Ptolemaic period but this room was filled with every pottery that you saw in dynasty by the end of dynasty 26. So I have a place that is that produced two different kinds of archeological material. Wait on me and I'll tell you in the publication when I find out exactly what's happening with the backfilling of this shaft. But the dog there is definitely a representation of Horace the Hound, the embalmer. And there was a lot, uh, a large amount of uh, fly larva in the, in, the, in the belly of the dog, which means it has been killed and put aside for quite some hours, maybe three to four hours, to allow the, the fly larva to be activated and feed onto the cadaver, which means it was not, the entombment of this dog was not an immediate entombment. It has to be uh, killed and then put aside during whatever preparation of whatever ritual happening, and then it was put in there. And I had a very long talk with Salima about that possibility of the growth of the fly larva inside it. And Arthur asked, do you have any theories as to why the bodies would have been embalmed underground? Yes. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you want to go through a mummification process, um, you need a very well ventilated space. And this is why I said um, in 2018, when we announced the discovery of this mummification complex, I get an invitation from the anatomy department here in Tübingen one of the very oldest anatomy departments in Europe. And in fact, one of the very still practicing embalming uh, un, uh, departments in Europe because formaldehyde, the substance that used for uh, fixing human bodies, um, is cancerous and there is a lot of limitation. In fact, it will be banned in 2025. So anatomists are looking for a different substance to fix human body. And when they heard about our discovery, they wanted to know from me what kind of oils and tell them about the mummification workshop because they want to take the results of our residue analysis and identification of these oils and then try to use them as new fixatives of human bodies. So one of the things that when I explained this room and what action would take place, would happen um, underground right here, 
their main question for me was the ventilation. D, 30 meters deep, um, do you think there's enough air? And I had to, and I smiled because I told them this corridor right here is becoming the air shaft that brings air inside here and makes this room really cool. And for them and for myself, knowing the weather of Egypt and how humid and hot it is, dealing with human body, human cadaver for 70 days, you would need a very well ventilated space so to deal with the, 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 the smell and also you don't want the bodies to rot. So it makes perfect sense to skate the heat above ground and this humid and go down 30 meters deep and, re, and reappropriate existing structures and turn them into your ventilation system right here. Brings fresh air all the time, makes it really cool here. The temperature, believe me, when I was in Sakar, temperature is about 15 degrees less than above ground. Uh, thank you for that. The next one is uh, by Mustafa, and he's asked whether uh, it's possible to find another uh, Ibu at Saqqara. I hope I will be the one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Um, there is uh, very interesting. Um, Salim Hassan, when he was uh, excavating um, area around Abu Sir, no, uh, not Salim Hassan. Salim Hassan wrote about the uh, the tomb, the Mastaba of Washpatah in Abu Sir. And Washpatah, being a vizier, has written in the text that um, his king has donated or ordered his private ibu to be established in front of his uh, tomb. So that's very interesting. We might have individual ibus um, in front of some mastabas, but I don't want to criticized early generation of archaeologists because those are the giants of our field who just give us everything that we can build on. But careful excavations um, would have given us some of those private ibus. I would expect somebody like Meraruka, for example, would have his own ibu, but we don't know how it was excavated. But we know from Washpita that an ibu was built for him in front of his tomb. So there is a possibility of another Ibu. Uh, who knows, there might be another complex of mummification workshop. You have to keep in mind, um, this is a mummification workshop that still have, from what I have in K24, only 50, uh, 54 individuals. Yes, there is more in the second dynasty galleries, but you have to keep in mind, Saqqara was in um, a cemetery for three, over 3,000 years. And also there was animals mummified in Saqqara. So where are the mummification workshops for all these animals that was on the industrial level? This is not a, an individual mummification. This is industrial level mummification here. You have to produce those mummies of the cats, of the dogs, of the falcons for uh, sell. You sell them. So there has to be um, facilities for this somewhere in Saqqara. Thank you, Dr. Ramadan. The next question is from Jill. She wonders, is there any way of knowing what the human tissue inside the two extra canopic jars of Taditi Bastet were? Yeah, um, the, only th the only thing that we're doing, um, uh, Dr. Sahar Slim, um, my professor of radiology, and she's a radiographer on the, on the project, she's now taking her measurements of what could be those tissues uh, be. Um, no idea. I had made an assumption on, on camera. I said, let's think about other things that we don't usually see. We don't say, we don't hear anything about the kidneys. We don't hear anything about the brain. In fact, people think the, the Egyptians were getting rid of the brain and all these things. I don't know. It wasn't always the case. You might have, um, you don't have, what would happen to the kidneys? We didn't know anything. So would, would we have some of the kidneys of Didi, uh, Tadi Dibusted in there? Would we have some of the brain? No idea. So this is a question for Dr. Sahar Salim after she makes all her uh, measurements and calculations and everything and comparing things. Keep in mind that 
um, were our, one of the few projects that had CT scan um, canopic jars. There is one project in Zurich that doing a lot of work on canopic jars. And I would like at some point to just join efforts and talk about what we have. Um, so to be able to know the form of every organ, every canopic jar, you need to uh, sit the pattern and sit the pattern of measurements. Okay, the kidney uh, or the, the liver measures that much. How many examples do we have? So CT scanning canopic jars is not something that has been done in wide scale. Um, there's a few projects where one of them would like to join forces to get a final conclusion as what does the stomach look like or the spleen look like inside a canopic jar? What does the liver look like? What does the intestines look like? So because this you're not going to get from CT scanning one canopic jar. And connected to that as well, did you, did you analyze all the six jars and I suppose the other burials? That had to be? Uh, not yet, because not yet. This, is the, this is the project that we would like to go forward. Uh, this is a very interesting thing. Um, I, have, I keep discussions with those uh, anatomists and tubing in all the time. And one of the things, apparently um, mummification in anatomy is a big thing and they call it fixation of human body. So they have it, um, they have different even terminology. They have uh, a big debate as to what is embalming, what is mummification, what is fixation. So these are three different terms. So one of the things that we were talking about is that uh, about the substance, the list of substance I have right now. And uh, they told me, you know, human organs and human bodies, they react differently to the same substance. So if you use a certain fixative, um, don't expect the stomach to react to that fixative the same way a liver would react. And I was like, ha, huh, would that be a possibility why the Egyptians had to separate all these four because they're using different um, substance in the embalming of all these four organs. This will make us go back and after we finish our residue analysis of the pottery corpus, which is huge, we're going to move to the uh, vessels, the canopic jars we have. All sits that we have, the Yawit uh, sit, Tarihur sit, um, Didi Busted, and all even the, the, the pottery ones. So we have a nice about 16 or 18 of all of them that comes from tomb six, including the other ones from uh, the above. And we have a good material for another good project of analyzing the content or contents of these kind of jars. And connected to that as well as the analysis of the mummification jars as well, which was uh, fantastic. I think of the first episode of the show in which it turned out that the antu was not... Um, uh, myrrh, but cedar oil, and Paula Vega was interested in that and whether you've got any more updates to that uh, on the analysis side. Yeah, um, this is very interesting because uh, it looks like all along, Antio is in Egyptian sources, it's been only Antio, 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 and we think of myrrh, myrrh, myrrh. But if you go to the early, did a Ptolemaic period, the, the texts in the Ptolemaic temples um, do differentiate all these kinds of unto you. There is not just one unto you. There is so many unto you. They have it in, they differentiate the colors, the texture of these unto you. So it, when I was doing the residue analysis of it, I was thinking, okay, myrrh, frankincense, maybe. But it ended up to be a cedar byproduct, uh, either in the resin form or in the oil form or a paste form. So it's very interesting to look at these three things. A cedar, a cedar oil is a process to produce the oil. Then, but if it is an unguant form, this is another, and it takes a chemist another step to turn it into an unguant or a paste. And if it is um, something that is very solid, that's another thing. So we know it's a a cedar pie product, either in a resin form or in the oil form. But it looks like it's something, it's a, it's a cedar tar. Cedar tar means 
you get the oil or the resin and you, then you have to heat it up. This is another chemical process. So you get your embalmer who is a professional ritualist, businessman, and also a chemist to, to get another chemical process, to expose this oil into another chemical process to get a different substance with different quality and properties. So from what we get uh, so far, on camera, we only knew it's a cedar pie product, either resin or oil. Now we know it's a cedar tar. So that's a very interesting. Thank you so much. I had a very interesting question from Bob regarding how do you think the ancient Egyptians would have managed to get down these massive shafts? Would they have used ladders? Is there any evidence of how they would have got up and down? Yes. Um, a, a small shaft like M23 right here, we know um, even from the ostracon that we found in Dar Medina about how the Egyptians would put their foot in footholds um, on the two side walls of the shaft and use ropes and they go down. So in this small shaft, excuse me, in this small shaft, M23, we have footholds um, all the way and they put their foot in there using a rope and they go down. And this is how the Egyptians uh, portrayed it on this ostracon from Dar Medina. But on this big one right here, the, the footholds, not on the two opposite walls, but actually in the corner here, in the two walls in the corner. And of course, they would use shaft. Uh, uh, sorry, they would use ropes to go down. But this is the only way we see it in, in reality. This is how, probably how they, do it, how they did it. And this is how they told us they do it. We still have uh, 18 questions, so there are quite a lot. So I don't know, I don't know how many <laughs> you want to take, Ramadan. Probably just uh, just a few. You, you should be able to see the questions, by the hey, way, listen, by clicking I, on uh, them. I, I, I'm willing to take all 18 questions. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, there there might even be more that come up by yeah. then, but as long as you're happy to do so. Yeah, but if you, uh, if, if everybody allows me, I need to take this thing off. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's getting stifling in here. <laughs> so. Yeah. So the next uh, two questions are by Pal, uh, yeah. who has uh, said that he really enjoys listening to your uh, your lectures and has two queries. Uh, what is, can you repeat or uh, emphasize again the facts regarding the link between bugs and mummies uh, and the layer used to place the intestines? Yes, um, the links between in Book of the Dead, uh, chapter thirty six. It's the vignette of that chapter shows the deceased have a, a spear in hand and spearing a cockroach-like bug, exactly like this one. The text talks about fighting um, bugs that feeds on the, core, on the mummy itself. So it's an apotropaic act. It's an act of repelling this um, bug that will eventually eat the mummy. So that's the connection here. And on a related note to that, someone has, uh, Gail has asked whether you can say anything about the uh, scientific name of the insect. Uh, Lithecarus nilithicus, and believe me, I cannot spell it out. But it <laughs> Something is like that. Uh, it's, it's, the Nile is part of it. Lithecarus nilithicus, but it's, hold on, I can push it out here. I can write it in the, um, in the chat. chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I can, I can hear the next question if you have it. Okay, whilst you're writing that one down, we've had a question from Annette asking, uh -huh. could the bodies found be possibly used to practice mummification? Were these definitely paid burials? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, um, as, as I said, from all these um, uh, mummification papyri and the archives of embalmers, we know that the Mummification was a business, and there's always business transactions um, where embalmers would have to write contracts with uh, in, an individual. Even we have an instance from Hawara where two embalmers fighting over one corpus because they say, hey, I had a contract with him. No, 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 it was me first. So definitely, um, and we have archives from families of embalmers who kept the records uh, of all the uh, contracts they had with all those individuals. I hope I'm answering this one correctly. 
And on a slightly related note to that, uh, Mohammed has asked is, uh, can we get more information about the dis uh, demotic disagreement between the mother and the daughter-in-law? Uh, uh, maybe there's the same problem in demotic sources. Yeah, uh, why was I'm the son not allowed to be buried there? Is that uh, mentioned in the text? Uh, um, maybe that he didn't uh, look after his mother uh, in her old age. No, the text is not big enough for all this um, reconstruction. Uh, we had a text that's only about four to five lines. Um, in fact, the um, the very rough translation gives exactly the um, a year of the scribe that we the year of the scribe i don't know which one um can whoever is sorry whoever is asking for the scientific name the latin root uh, yeah, the thing it, um, was it, was i'm it? sharing my screen right okay yeah yeah that's that's it yeah it was gail gail gibson who hopefully is still in the room yeah i hope she got it so she can say something so um for uh, uh, what's his name who asked the question mustafa or ahmed um muhammad i think was muhammad it? let me see oh you're, <laughs> you're playing it safe if it's not mustafa yes it was muhammad. it was muhammad <laughs> okay <laughs> so, muhammad uh helmi issa uh, Muhammad Hamid Isa. <laughs> okay, no, he's in the next room. I can answer, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, no, is um, we don't have much of this text. We are, the only text is the the only thing we have is about four to five lines, and it's talking about the the wife now talking, uh, addressing the mother in law, saying if you if you disagree with the with his burial. Um, in this place, you can open the cave, which is that little thing. So it's very interesting. Even when we study this one, um, I have to understand. I have to know why the wife needs to make a, pu a public announcement of that uh, particular incident. Um, that's an interesting thing. If you're talking about somebody is making sure this has been recorded but also she wants it to be seen which means k24 was never meant to be backfilled it was a place where there is people coming in and out all the time if you want to commemorate this incident you put it somewhere where people can see it and this is why when i was digging k24 i was like never looks like this was an the the back feeling was an act a one a moment action that's why i have my brilliant um soil mechanic engineer who is a professor a professor of rock mechanic engineering in swiss university ayman who is a peer who appears with me on the movie um he's taking samples from k24 the sand uh fill of k24 every 50 centimeters we have a sample because we wanted to do morphological analysis of the fill of the shaft in order to know exactly the process of backfilling, whether it was a natural wind blown sand or it was something different. And very interestingly, the 30 meter deep shaft produces one shirt of a new kingdom, only one shirt of a new kingdom, but none of any other thing but Dynasty 26 material. Which, um, interestingly enough, the cups we found um, in, in the mummification workshop, it turned up um, the Dutch Italian mission in the new kingdom cemetery right next to us have found another embalming cachette with some of those cups as well. Now we need to join forces and know exactly what's happening. We can even uh, include the material um, because I did this residue analysis in Egypt, by the way, and this was one of the biggest success that I've ever had. Um, I know there is infrastructure, good infrastructure for scientific research in Egypt, but where, who to talk to and where to go, that's the issue. So we were able to bring the archaeometrist from Tübingen working with the chemists in Egypt and in the Egyptian lab of the National Research Center, because also 
ministry, you cannot take samples out of Egypt. So you got to find a way to do it in Egypt. And that's what makes me so happy that I can help out other colleagues to do this kind of research in that facility. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Amadan. The next question is from Jan, and she asks, would there have been a water source or drainage in the underground mummification workshop to wash away all the yucky bits? Yes, um, there was, in fact, this one right here, I hope. I'm sorry I don't have an, a good image of it, but in other slides, and slides, I have it. In the back of this ledge, this ledge goes all the way, occupies this entire space. This is uh, about five meter long. In the back, there is a channel and it goes on the sides and runs on the floor of this room. One interesting issue is would the fluids, the bodily fluids, drained into the floor and you waste it? Or would you need to collect it at some point? That's a question I'm asking myself. Um, I think permatext uh, spill 32 is about libation. And in fact, there is that substance in the text that um, the, the text of permatext 30, 32 talks about the rouge, rouge substance, the rouge fluid, which we don't know exactly whether, whether it was the blood or human fluid or what exactly, that the spill, the, 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 the priest is talking to the deceased as Osiris and telling him after this desiccation of his body, the, the, the body is completely dried, there is no bodily fluid in it anymore. You need to revive it. So they bring back the rouge into the body after it's been mummified. So that's vital liquids goes back into the body. There, I think that the bodily fluid during the evisceration process being collected in order to be ritually used during the recitation of this particular spell that could be a situation. Not sure, but it is a scenario, something to think about. I'll ask a couple of questions here since there's a short one. The first one from Vanessa is, uh, was that uh, Scott Williamson uh, scanning at the bottom of the shaft? Uh, that's the, the, the model? What, oh. One of the guys, I guess, who was working on the model? Scott Williamson? No, that, that's, that, that is Philip. Uh, Philip. Philipp Kluge from okay. uh, Germany. Philipp Kluge, yeah. Okay. So that was an easy one. And uh, Bob has asked that one of the, and this was picked up as well, but I've seen a few people uh, talk about this, that one of the canopic jars seemed to have the head of a cat on it, rather cat. than, uh, yes. The, no. the Duamutef one looked a bit like a cat, rather because, than uh, a gecko, but was, maybe uh, like, it, it, it had a very yeah. small head. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it, it was a jackal. <laughs> Yeah, but, but it was lying. You saw the chin. So, no. Well, as I said, it, this complex is full of surprises. Yeah. And, um, I hope, I like surprises because it wouldn't be interesting if we find this, you know, more of the same. And we have a question about where a lot of the materials would have been got from. Would it be the priests themselves making those journeys to get the resources? Uh, listen, no, I don't think uh, you need to, as I said, when we talk about the economics of mummification, you talk about the long distance trade and the international trade um, in substance that is very expensive like this. I think um, it's not the priests, you have the suppliers now. If, like every industry, you always, the industry is based on the suppliers and the suppliers here are those long distance trade merchants, the people who travel far away and bring these exotic uh, products. And that's why it's expensive. So, but not the priests. The priests pretty much are people who would ask suppliers to bring them the, the, the material. And a few connected questions with that is uh, uh, relating to the cedar, obviously seemingly imported from Lebanon and uh, 
Mary, Mary pointed out that it'd be interesting to see how many other substances are imported and uh, related to that is the question about the silver mask uh, yes. and whether you know where that's coming from. Is that from Anatolia, Crete? The yeah, silver? it's very interesting. Um, I have a long list of these um, <laughs> names of um, uh, plants and oils and resins and everything include, include there's a lot of pistachio in there. So a lot of these cups and bowls have uh, pistachio. And we're making our classification based on two things, on the text that is on this uh, pottery, on the form of the pottery, whether a cup or a bowl, and also um, the, the residue inside them. And it looks there's a lot of pistachio in there, not just the cedar. This is so much pistachio in so many different things. And pistachio, of course, is imported. The, uh, you know, either Southern Europe, uh, Anatolia, the Levant area, this is another prime places. But there is another uh, resin that uh, the name's skipping my head because I'm not an archaeometry guy. Um, a plant that is originally from India and from West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, something with LM, I can't remember what it is. Um, but you need to just exclude West Africa as an origin of this trade. But of course, India via Persia would be a place where you get this particular resin from. So it's another interesting thing. Uh, the wood we have a lot of it, uh, we have a lot of common yew, uh, and common yew comes from Southern Europe. It's a very interesting one that is very durable, durable wood, and also um, it has the ability to fight insects, but it was completely destroyed with our insect infestation, which this is actually the wood um, from which Tadi uh, Bastid's coffin made of, and Tadi Hor as well. So we're talking about very expensive products in here. Uh, the silver mask, we are in the process of uh, conducting a lit isotope to know exactly where the silver comes from because the, the, uh, the silver mask with the uh, gilded layer and the, the, the dust and everything over it weighed um, 265 grams. So this is huge wealth for somebody in antiquity. So I think we're talking about the possibility of having an island in the Eastern Mediterranean as a source of this mask is huge because this is where it's always coming from. Um, the also important thing is to compare other silver objects that came from the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom uh, to our silver mask when we get our uh, lead isotope analysis uh, done. Important thing about this silver mask that I always think about is the manufacture technique. The Egyptians knew how to make an alloy of gold and silver. That's the electron one, mixing it together. But actually covering a plate of silver with a layer of gold, that is a technology that was not um, you know, known to Egyptians at the time. It was very common in the Greek world and in the Persian world. Um, the Greek world in particular, um, one thing I have on my mind right now is Homer in the Odyssey describing um, one of the Greek gods coming out of the water of the Mediterranean and have this flowery language about it and says his form looks like a perfect um, object that is made by, by a skilled craftsman who knows how to cover silver with gold, to pour gold over silver. So which means even in the Bronze Age Greece, in the late Bronze Age Greece, you, would, you, you hear them about this technology of covering silver plate with gold, uh, but it's not in Egypt. In Egypt, you make an alloy. So then you need to know something about that transfer of technology and how it was made in Sephar, and who would make it? Is it an Egyptian or an immigrant from a Greek origin or a Persian origin, or the technology has been transferred into Egypt? There is so many questions to talk, uh, to ask 
just looking at one gilded silver mask. We appreciate the aesthetics. We have fun and we're very happy having discovered one of the third, you know, one of the third or the kind. This is the third ever. But then comes the, the questions, the, how to interrogate this object, you know, with these so many questions. And I do believe that silver mask was made for somebody, not the lady over there. It's another thing, another issue. So there is so many, even the, the gems, the gemstones uh, for, used for the inlay, obsidian was one of them, calcite was one of them. So you get some very expensive object here. We'll have to get you back to do another lecture just on the mask at this rate. <laughs> <Be happy. laughs> uh, if you could just clarify for one of the people listening, there was the area above ground and the area below ground where mummification was taking place. Could you elaborate what happened differently yes. in the two areas, please? Yes. Um, let me fish it out. Oh, no. I'm looking at a different thing. Uh, okay. We still have people staying, or should people left. So yeah, 126 afraid, people still on. <laughs> 26 people. One, 126. 126 people, okay. <laughs> we, gonna and have we have 11 people? questions left because they keep coming. <laughs> okay, so the area underground, as I said, from the Old Kingdom, we know important, two important structures from the Old Kingdom scenes. Uh, the Wabit, that's the workshop, and then the Ibu, that's the purification tent. They're clearly very separate in terms of where they're located. One of them, the Wabit, is in somewhere in the cemetery. The Ibu could either be somewhere where there is running water or right in front of the tomb. So they're not spatially connected. They're far apart. When the body is mummified, it's been taken to the purification tent. It was a temporary one, even the uh, Old Kingdom Valley Kings have been thought as the private Ibu of the Kings. But after that, the two different units become part of a bigger complex that is called the Paranether or the House of Rejuvenation, including other places like a, a room for the Haut Nichiri, that's the Netron, a room for the Haut Noob, that is the uh, linens, a room for the Hemag, the Osiris Hemag, that's for the amulets. Uh, that's a hole. There is so many um, units inside the Perth effort that we know the names of these units from the uh, mummification papyri. But here we have a Wabit underground right here that is reached through this shaft, small shaft M23, and above ground you have a rectangular building like here. Its layout looks exactly like the layout of the Ibu, the tent of purification that you see it in the Old Kingdom scenes. That is why I called it Ibu-like structure. But inside this Ibu, so we have underground, what happens here is the evisceration of the body. You take out the organs, that is why you needed that large vessel incense burner because you need the incense as a deodorizer of the entire room. You don't want to smell this. And the other thing is for the bug repellent, the drives insects away when you have to deal with human cadaver, you don't want insects. And the other thing for, for the burning incense is the ritual purpose of incense. When, because the embalmer, while they are really going through the process of mummification, they also going through a rich sets of rituals. What all of them, it would involve burning incense. So underground here, you would have the evisceration of the body, with this incense burner going on, and the new air that moves through the shaft, the underground galleries, and makes it cool underground here, and makes it perfect environment for evisceration of bodies. Once the bodies are eviscerated. Uh, body treatment happens above ground in the form of dehydration inside this basin right here using salt, uh, the nitrogen salt, 
in the form of wrapping the mummies with linen um, um, wrappings that is soaked with bitumen or this black substance residence and prepared in this room right here. And after you finish, the burial happens in the communal shaft that is K24 right here. Very complex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to combine a few questions again. So um, Pam has asked, do we know anything more about the goddess uh, nu uh, Nuchasis? And uh, Stevie also asked what the name of the goddess was. So, um, <clears throat> If you're going to go straight forward and have a literal word by word, word for word translation, Newt means city, She means lake, S is the possessive pronoun her. So the city is her, is her lake. That's the only thing you can translate. I have a very big doubt right now about new chess, um, not just being a form of Sekhmet in the in the, in Saqqara. I started to think, would new chess really be more of a Libyan um, goddess? I'm not sure. So don't take my word for it. But it would make sense if you think about this Libyan influence on Dynasty 26. The Dynasty 24, originally those are the ancestors of Dynasty 26. They have huge connection to the Libyan communities in Egypt, uh, which means those are the Egyptianized Libyans who immigrated to Egypt in Dynasty 20, before Dynasty 22 and became the kings of Egypt in Dynasty 22. And then their gen, about Chani Meet and Yiput, maybe six, seven generation Egyptianized Libyans living in Egypt. And Dynasty 26, make it, also keep in mind Psamtik, the very name pa Semetek, pa es Metek. He is the man of the Metek and whatever Metek be, Metic being the line in as a Libyan word or a Libyan god himself. So we we don't know. Like, you know, he is Sa en Wusrit, for example, that's the pattern of his personal name. Sa in Wusrit, the S in Wusrit, the man of Usrit, and then becomes Pasa Metic, the man of the Metic. So it makes us think a lot about, you know, the the political influence of the Egyptianized Libyans at the time, especially when you look at the demographic composition of Egypt in Dynasty 26, a lot of Greek immigrants in Nocrates, that's your merchants, a lot of Greek immigrants as merchants, a lot of Libyan immigrants as, uh, sorry, as mercenaries um, as well. So, you have a society, Phoenicians also, you have a society that is completely um, heterogeneous when it comes to ethnicities and colors and even cultures, but they're all living under one unifying culture that is the Egyptian culture. So, but um, New Chess, I'm starting to think about, mm -hmm, would New Chess be really more of a Libyan influence? Because all we know about her is that her name written with a city, and then the lake, and then the S, even from Dynasty 19. But what does the name mean? If you want a translation, the translation goes, the city is her lake. And whose lake? And whose city? Would that actually, like, let us talk about Mut as Nebit Ishiru, and the Ishiru, and all the city of the Ishiru in Karnak? It's, all, it's just a question at this point. But the thing is, we have the largest occurrences of new chess um, and only in one place, all of them in one place. We have at least four mentions of them, three very um, securely seen and visible mentions of new chess. And the fourth one is just, you know, we see traces of it. So four and four priestess, uh, and priestesses and priests for her so but i don't know exactly what the name of the, the her name means but i could see a lot of connections with her not only in the serpent goddesses but also in the feline goddesses possibly busted possibly 
uh, Sekhmet, and I think Sekhmet is a bigger candidate in Saqqara. Uh, 